I am Isabel, and the other, the other participant that's not uh, Stephen or Deidre is Jenny. Um, and we're students at the UCLA uh, Getty Conservation Cultural Heritage Program. Um, and we're going to start this program off with a land grant acknowledgement. Even though we're not all physically in Los Angeles right now, that's sort of where the heart and core of our program is. Um, so we're going to start with the land grant acknowledgement for the Los Angeles area. <laughs> Um, so the UCLA Getty IDP would like to acknowledge the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovang are the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanukvatam, the ancestors, the Ahihiram elders, and the Iohinkem, um, our relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. Thank you. Um, with that, we want to thank everyone for being here. We're really excited to welcome you to this um, today's version of the UCLA Getty Conservation Conversation Series. Um, normally, these are held on the last Friday of every month, but this, this month is a little different because we wanted to accommodate spring break, which we all hope you get to enjoy. Um, we're always excited to welcome different guest speakers with different expertise in various areas of conservation. And today we're very excited to have Stephen Koop here, who's presenting on the conservation of archaeological glass, both in situ and in laboratory settings. So before we hand it off to um, Stephen, we will introduce um, our speaker. So Stephen Koob is the chief conservator um, emeritus of the Corning Museum of Glass, having recently retired from the museum. Um, Koob holds an uh, MA in Classical Archaeology from Indiana University and a BSc in Archaeological Conservation and Materials Science from the Institute of Archaeology, University of London. Before joining the Corning Museum staff in 1998, Koob worked for 11 years as conservator specializing in ceramics and glass at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur uh, M. Sackler Gallery at the Smithsonian Institution. A member of numerous professional organizations, including the Archaeological Institute of America, Koob is also a fellow of the International Institute of Conservation and, um, and the American Institute for Conservation. He recently replaced Dr. Robert Brill as chairman of Technical Committee 17, which studies the archaeometry and conservation of glass as part of the inter uh, International Commission on Glass. He is the author of the book, Conservation and Care of Glass Objects, published in 2006. Um, he is an expert in dealing with crizzling, a condition that affects unstable glass. In 2014, Koob received the Sheldon and Caroline Keck Award from the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, also known as AIC. The award is given to an individual who has a sustained record of excellence in the education and training of conservation professionals. For decades, he has devoted his time to training conservation interns at the Corning Museum of Glass, and he has taught conservation courses around the world. He has worked, taught, and supervised on numerous archaeological sites, including the Agora in Athens, Gordian, Turkey, and Samothrace in Greece. And with that, I will hand it over to Stephen. Okay, hey, thank you. Welcome everyone uh, from wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, hello here from Corning where it's sunny for the fourth day in a row and warm. And I'm so happy to see the snow melt. So I'm very happy to report that the groundhog was wrong as well. So we're gonna get started here. And I'm starting with the question of what is glass? So a little bit of history, technology, and chemistry to start with. When you think about it, glass is a very late technology. And why is that? We have pottery, metals, a thousands of years earlier than glass. The basic recipe is pretty simple. I have it here down at the bottom, 70% silica, 20% alkali, which can be soda, potash, or mixed, and then 10% lime. Well, the problem with making glass is the major component. It's the silica or sand. You just can't melt it. It requires 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,700 degrees centigrade. So that's where the alkali comes in. The alkali acts as a flux and allows the silica to melt at a much lower temperature around that of making ceramics. This basic recipe um, that you're seeing does not take into account minor percentages of colorants, but, 
but they don't really often affect the, uh, the, the preservation and deterioration of the glass. Interestingly, this recipe though was what the Romans made and it's actually what we still use today. It is the recipe for about 95% of all glasses. Glass is a solid, but an amorphous solid, despite all its components being crystalline. It is not some super cool liquid or fourth dimensional state of matter. It is a solid. So when you drop it, it does break indeed. It is non-porous and non-permeable. What classifies glass as archeological? Well, I think simply, simply the fact that it has been buried, whether it was thousands of years ago or recently, and then found or excavated. This recipe actually produces a glass that is quite stable. If you look at what has survived for thousands of years, as I said, it's non-porous and non-permeable property helps with this to some extent. These are some remarkably well-preserved glasses that you're looking at here. The bracelets on the left uh, from Gordian, sixth century BCE, and this little cup in, our, in the Corning Museum of Glass collection, uh, first century AD, probably from, from uh, Italy. Glass does have one major enemy, and that is water. The alkali in the glass is soluble to start with and remains soluble. And it's easily leached out during archeological burial if the burial environment gets wet. And so most of the glass in the Mediterranean region gets wet every winter and then dries out. The bangles you saw in the previous slide were found in a dry tomb, and so they never got wet. And so they never suffered any of this leaching of the alkali. The leaching of the alkali results in what we call weathering. We don't call it corrosion because it's very different from what happens with metals. The alkali is leached out, leaving behind a very thin layer of silica. And this recurs year after year or decade after decade it's not entirely clear what the rate reaction is, but it's not like tree rings. This was tested out by Dr. Brill. He, he looked at glass from a, a certain period of time and, and put the glass under the microscope and tried to count the layers and it just did not add up. So something stops it, whether it's temperature, whether it's more water, less water, we're not exactly clear on that one. But we have different types of weathering. And uh, Dr. Brill gave a lecture once where I think he showed 140 slides of different types of weathering. The pitting, the color, the depth, the uh, appearance generally. So here we have what we call iridescent weathering. It's got a kind of a rainbow effect to it. You're probably familiar with this, even if you find a piece of glass in your backyard that was buried maybe 10, 20 years ago, or even a Coke bottle. Uh, you'll see that it has a kind of oil slick or oil the appearance of you know, oil on water. So you get that rainbow effect. And that's why we call it iridescent. And iridescent comes from Iris. Iris was the goddess of the rainbow. We don't remove the weathering. It used to be removed routinely by archeologists because they wanted to see the color of the glass. But we, don't, we really don't do this anymore. And this is a good example why. So here you have an Aphrodite again from the Corning Museum of Glass collection. Uh, it's, it's developed uh, very thick weathering layers over a long period of burial, probably again, over just over 2000 years or close to that. And whoever found it or uh, whether it was illegally excavated or not, we don't know but they scraped off some of the weathering to look for, at the color of the glass. And as you can see, it's kind of a transparent purple. And so it's changed, it's altered quite a bit um, in, its, in its weathering. And you can see even in the belly, you've got some uh, iridescent showing up underneath this layer that we call opalescent. And the opalescence is fairly obvious because it looks like an opal. So if you remove that weathering, 
you're, you're removing layers of original glass, including the original surface. So we, we really do not do this. Uh, and it leaves you behind, as you can see on the thigh there, a really pitted, uh, uneven surface because the weathering doesn't always form absolutely solid layers. There's a good article on this by Sandra Smith called Opacity Contrary Wise. I think that's a great title. Um, it comes from the conference that was held at the British Museum in 1999. And it talks about uh, people who've argued that you should take it off or should not take it off and what, you're, what you are taking off. But in my mind, the main thing is, is it, it's removing some of the original surface. And as we know, the silica is basically the most stable part of the glass. So you're also removing a, a, a generally protective surface. We can get a regular preservation in glass. It's a very good example of an Islamic beaker that must have been buried at an angle, maybe in a drain or maybe in mud and then partially exposed uh, to an aggressive environment. The aggressive environments for glass tend to be alkaline. Anything with an alkaline pH is, is eventually going to do more damage than a neutral or acid burial. And so this piece, you know, very different preservation. Uh, the enamels are completely gone at the top and even the glass is etched. And here's probably the worst example I've ever seen again in the Corning Museum of Glass collection, where the weathering is so bad that it's peeling. It's literally peeling off the surface and, and curling up in these little, I would call them nests, like, like curly hair um, and, you know, collecting some dirt with them. They turn, it turns, you know, yellowish brown. And then these, this pitting, this, this pitting, which looks like worm trails and actually once was suggested as worm trails are just, again, weathering. Weathering that starts with a, with a scratch. The scratch turns into a deeper little channel and then it weathers all the way around to form a tubular um, loss. So that's, that's about as bad as it gets. So let's look at retrieval of archeological glasses. Probably the most difficult is, is from underwater. This is a, a group of Opus Sectile panels that were found in Cancrii, Greece. They were excavated in the early 1960s. It was a real challenge because there were hundreds of these panels and they, do, they were still stacked as if they were in their original crates. And I think they were, the wood has, had rotten, rotted away. And they got buried through an earthquake that happened at that time and literally caused the building to sink into the harbor. Here's a better picture as they're uh, continuing to clean and continuing to expose the, the panels. They're quite large. Most of them were over a meter long. So they had almost full size figures on them. Um, the glass is, is, uh, is, it looks like stained glass, but it isn't. They're just sections of glass that are made up in a, in a, uh, uh, what's called a pasectile to form a, an image and then they're actually adhered to tiles. So they were meant to be either hung on the wall or put in, in, in buildings in some way, possibly on the floor uh, or on the walls. The challenge with these is of course, if it's from a saline solution, which this is the Mediterranean, uh, uh, you have salts getting in the weathering. Salts don't get into the glass. Those of you who are familiar with salts and ceramics, you know the problems it can cause. Well, this isn't the problem you have with glass. It's not the glass that's absorbing the salts, but the salts get trapped in those many, you know, hundreds and hundreds of layers of weathering. And if it's not taken out, then it's going to erupt at a later period and disrupt the weathering and do more damage. So the first and foremost thing is these needed to be desalinated. And the, they thought that the best way to do this was to consolidate them first and then desalinate them. Unfortunately, the choice of consolidant back then was a polyvinyl acetate, which doesn't do well in, in prolonged soaking. So I certainly would have done it in a different way, but there are ways to do this 
and James Roberts has published this, uh, working with glass from underwater uh, sites uh, around Copenhagen. And he used the acrylic, acrylic colloidal dispersion as a pre-consolidant. Another option for waterlogged glass would certainly be to, to get it into fresh water, desalinate it, and then dewater it. This would, could be very expensive and challenging because you'd probably want to use acetone. And then once it's de, uh, dewatered, then you could consolidate it with a resin, such as B72 or something else that you can replace the acetone with. It's, it's really, really probably one of the most challenging um, projects that still needs to be done because they only managed to treat over the last 45 years, uh, maybe 12 of these, these panels. And here's a detail of one of the panels. You can see the, the elaborate, uh, even uh, pers perspective that was done in, in making the building, buildings look, you know, three-dimensional. Uh, and, but note that the white, almost all of the white that you're looking at is weathering. And if that was removed, you would lose the dimensions of every one of those sections of glass. And you you probably have the color or not, because some of them actually weathered all the way through. And you would have very little detail in, in understanding of the construction. And this has been at, you know, this has been published. And I think one of the commentaries mentioned that if they'd cleaned it off, you probably wouldn't have realized that these are ionic capitals on the top of the columns. What about dry glass? Well, don't just excavate it or throw it in an envelope or plastic bag. That's probably going to give you headaches to come for, for many weeks thereafter. Because when you open those bags, you realize that somebody had stacked something else on top of them. And all you have is some smashed little fragments. So retrieval is probably one of the most important conservation aspects of getting glass from the ground, from a site, to a laboratory where it can be properly taken care of. Uh, and so open storage, if possible, in trays or uh, some kind of baskets, keep it out of the sun, keep it in the shade. And as you saw in the abstract that was presented, if it's damp, keep it damp. If it's wet, keep it wet. And if it's dry, keep it dry. Going through those fluctuations of temperature and humidity is not going to do your glass any good. And you keep in mind, again, you can have very irregular preservation. Some of this weathering can be intact and strong, and some of it can be just flaking off. So you may need to consider consolidation. And this can be done on site. It can be done uh, in the laboratory. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely necessary for a lot of these, these pieces that have weathering that has already started to flake off, which is exposing more avenues for handling problems. So what do we use for that? My suggestion, if I can get it to go ahead here, is, is Paraloid B72. I make it up in acetone, I'm at various solutions, because again, some of the weathering is more compact than others. Some of the weathering is actually quite open. You can literally almost see light between the layers. So you might want to start with a, a low percentage and, and, then, and then up it to 10 or 15%. You can add a little ethanol if you want to slow down the evaporation rate, and, but you should certainly use a brush and just touch it to the edges of the weathering so, so that it wicks in and goes right in underneath. And you'll see that it'll just get sucked in right underneath those, those edges and, and draw the, the layers back down to the glass. Uh, we do not recommend that you co completely coat a glass. So no, no, no immersion and no spray coating. So I wanted to show you um, an image of the largest amount of glass that was ever found in one place. And this is the Sergei Liman shipwreck off the coast of Turkey. 
and the glass resides in the Bodrum Museum in Turkey. And a lot of NYU students went there and worked on this, this collection um, to help, help the, uh, for the conservation. Can you imagine sorting and looking for joins with tens of thousands of pieces of glass? How do you even start? Well, as they did, they sorted it by color. But you could also then follow that up by sorting with, by shape, thickness, diagnostic elements. Diagnostic elements are what we refer to as rims, bases, handles. And then there's also uh, decoration. And some of these were incised and carved. And so I did, I did have some decoration. And I love showing this, uh, this next slide, which is the success that, that took place in working with this collection. They were actually able to find complete vessels. And this is interesting because this is 11th century AD. And why was there so much glass on this ship? Well, two reasons. It made good ballast. So it, it, it weighed down the ship so that it could travel better. Maybe all too much because it, it sank. But also because glass was being recycled, even in ancient times. So they, we've got nothing on, the, on, on antiquity. Uh, they were uh, recycling glass because it can be easily remelted and made into new vessels. So this takes me to probably my most favorite subject, which is the choice of an adhesive for glass. And it shouldn't surprise you again that um, I, I've chosen Paraloid B72. I started uh, using this and in about 1984, I introduced it to the conservation community, studies in conservation in 1986. And when I went to the Corning Museum of Glass, I introduced it to the, the museum there in 1994. So it's got quite a history and I hope that will continue. So why? Why B72? There are so many good reasons. Its stability doesn't yellow. It's extens been extensively tested. It's easily soluble and reversible, water clear, but I have tinted it and colored it. It has excellent bond strength, especially for glass. And it's compatible with numerous substrates. And we can use it in safe solvents like just acetone or acetone and ethanol. And it's easy to prepare and apply with precision and accuracy. So most of my interns who come to have come to the museum always question whether this is the right adhesive to use. But I start them out with it and it doesn't take long to convince them because it's so much easier to work with than epoxies. Here's the basic recipe. I don't think you need to copy this down. It should be published uh, anytime soon with the, uh, the AIC uh, post prints from the objects meeting in Chicago, which was 2018. They're a little behind schedule, but we've, we've done the, uh, the proofs. And so that should be coming out anytime, sometime soon. And even though the talk I gave discussed both ceramics and glass, you'll see this recipe in there. It's, it's much thinner than what I make up for ceramics because glass is very unforgiving. Joints need to be really tight and you don't need much adhesive, even in thin archeological glass. Uh, it just takes practice and more practice and more practice. Um, back to the making it up, um, you suspend this in a, in a, in a bag uh, in, a, in the acetone I add the fume silica first. So here you're looking at the front with the recipe and then on, and looking at the back, you have it, this bag of gauze or cheesecloth with the 50 grams of B72 suspended in the jar, just touching the acetone. And though it, although it's counterintuitive to, uh, to not agitate, um, you should not agitate it. Let gravity do the work for you. I discovered this late on, but, um, about 15 years ago, but it saves you a lot of time and effort and, and you don't have to even evaporate off any solvent. We're making up a, a recipe that is, is gonna produce the adhesive you need to use. 
And a lot of people ask, what is that percentage? That percentage works out to about 50% weight to volume. I've always made it up weight to weight just because it's easier to remember 50 grams than anything else. And it used to be 50 and 100, and I would evaporate off some of the acetone. So this really works, uh, and but it's uh, most important that you put it into tubes. You're gonna have all kinds of problems if you use it out of a jar with a brush or a pipette. Please get some tubes, put it into the tubes, just pour it into the tubes, Take your pair of pliers here and crimp the ends and, and you've got enough B72 to last you probably for a year or more. And don't worry about its strength. Some of you have probably seen this. I like showing this. It was a copy of a commercial that was done on about super glue that they used to show at the Super Bowl every year. They haven't shown it for a long time. And I couldn't find an I-beam to hang a hat from, but um, uh, so so we, we, we glued a block of wood to the ceiling and drilled it through, I mean, drilled it through the hat and then and connected to the, to the wood and then the wood was uh, attached to the ceiling with the B-72. I needed some help for somebody to take the chair out from under me, but it's a great picture. And the, it does show that the strength is there. I've tested the strength. DuPont has tested the strength of B72 and the Getty has tested it. And we've all come up with about 200 to 600 pounds per square inch, which is, which is plenty strong enough to hold any kind of glass together. And how do we glue it together? Well, there are many ways of uh, joining fragments, especially glass. One of the common ways of using an epoxy was to tape the glass together first and then wick it in using the epoxy because the epoxy would take hours and hours to set. So you had lots of time to, to drip it along the break, break edges. It's very messy. It's a lot of cleanup, but it does work. With B72, I prefer to use what I call piece by piece assembly. And that's mostly how I work. So this piece is one you cannot tape together for the simple reason that it's got weathering on the outside and you really have very limited access to the inside. So you generally start with the, the base and work up. So this has a very large base, which is solid and quite, quite strong right here. And you start adding fragments around the exterior of the base. And with B72, you don't have to do anything complicated with with your, with your adhesive. You just apply it to one edge, you put the piece on, you press it and squeeze out the excess adhesive and you're basically done. You don't pull the pieces apart. You don't re-wet them at this point. You just, um, you just join them. Uh, so you can only do a few pieces at a time because the adhesive will take up to you know, 20 minutes, maybe an hour to set, even longer for thicker pieces. So you may need to just do two or three joins a day. So I, I did this piece and it took all of six hours, but it took six hours over a period of three months. And that's because I was only doing it on a weekend, Saturday and Sundays, and I was only doing two, three, four joins a day. And so I would let them set and and uh, come back the next week and, and continue. You can do cleanup with B72 almost immediately um, on one side. So it's good to have these three things. You need a binocular microscope to check your joins. Doesn't need to go to very high power. So just you know five to 20 maybe uh, is all you need. But it's amazing what you see under the microscope as to whether your join is perfectly lined up or not. You can look at you know, weathering, you can look at scratches, you can look at air bubbles, you can see a, a lot of detail just under that kind of magnification. Acetone is really necessary for cleanup and you can almost immediately clean up one side of the glass, preferably the outside, because you're never gonna see the inside on a vessel like that. But you can clean up at that point, and I usually do a little bit of cleanup just before looking at it under the microscope, and then I'll put it down and check it again later. If you've made mistakes, you can do 
You can move it again using a little more acetone by softening the join, or you can use a, a hair dryer or a heat gun. If you're using a heat gun, keep it at a fair distance from the glass and, and also move it around uh, all the time so that you're not heating up one piece or one area of the, the glass more than another. Here's another piece, uh, one of my favorites that came into the museum just 10 years ago. And it's an inlaid, inlaid bowl uh, with a, a purple glass and all these little, little small uh, figures of birds and a dragonfly. Uh, dragonfly is, is right here. We're embedded into this slab of glass, probably having the, uh, the purple glass pressed down onto these pieces that were laid out on a table. And then it was reshaped, ground and polished, and uh, uh, was, became a tour de force. There's only one of these that's intact in the world, and we have it. Uh, while, while it was broken apart, it gave us a phenomenal opportunity to look at the cross section of the, the breaks and to, uh, to analyze the colorants in the glasses using XRF. It was a really great opportunity to learn so much more about the multicolors here. There's three greens, there's two blues, there's a uh, red and pink. And it, it just was a fabulous, fabulous project. And here it is in its completed state. So we don't have time to go over loss compensation or fills. Uh, I just want to show you a couple examples of what possibilities there are. Uh, it certainly can be done. It structurally reinforces the glass and makes it look certainly better if you're putting it on exhibition. But people are so used to seeing broken ceramics, archaeological ceramics, and broken archaeological glass, that it's not absolutely necessary unless you do have it for structural needs. The, the piece in the middle here shows you a, a, a fill, a couple of fills that were done here in the basic color of the glass. This is how you would start, as we did again on the left. Uh, but if you want to take it one step further, you can look at the right here and just touch it up with acrylic paints. And then it looks just like the original glass. This all depends on the ethics, aesthetics that you're looking for, whether your curator or director appreciates seeing the fills or not. So, and this has varied in my career, every place I've worked. So it, it, it's, it's worth having that discussion if you're gonna do it. But the reason why we can't spend much time on this is it takes an incredible amount of effort to do this. Um, it's not only time, uh, in the in the sense of weeks or months of work, but you also can't do it in the field, and you need a really good lab setup in con controlled conditions. So I just have one more, which was in uh, one of the pictures that was in the abstract, and this is the one of the blue beakers, and I did this in a very different way of reconstruction. So I used plaster of Paris first to fill in the losses. And then I took the piece apart again, because it was all assembled with B72. I took the pieces apart again, and then I took molds of those plaster pieces and silicone molds, and that's what you're seeing here in the middle. After working out the color, which is quite tricky because cobalt blue is one of the most difficult colors to match. So I cast individual fragments. And I think you can see those in the bottom slide here. Um, some of these pieces are much more uniform than others, and those are the fills. So these are fills that are made just by casting that. So the plaster piece was from here, and that's the piece that became this, last, this uh, epoxy piece. So I used epoxy for this, and then glued everything back together again with B72. This has been published. It was in the AIC uh, preprints. i um, not sure the year, but probably 2004, 2006, somewhere in there. It might have been the Miami conference. It's called, um, uh, it was two or four beakers. The question was, was when it was ac acquisitioned, they had acquisitioned the, the bases as bottles and the tops as beakers. And the director of the museum and I sorted out that they were actually just two beakers. I wanna finish up with packing and storage and leave some time for questions. Certainly don't pack any of your glass in cotton. You can imagine 
the difficulties in trying to clean this up. Uh, so stay away from that. So we saw this piece before. Handling is a problem because it's got a it's got weathering, but there is, is some solid glass there. You can you can see that you can actually get your fingers around and you can handle it. Uh, the way to pack this is to make a cavity pack. You can use you know polyester uh, uh, blocking or whatever, uh, even cotton underneath the tissue, but not on top. And then you have a cavity pack right here where this piece can just rest in there. That way it doesn't have to be handled, but it can be looked at, it can be evaluated, and it doesn't take so much room in storage. If you were making a mount for it and hanging it by its handles, it would take a lot of space in storage. So this is a, certainly an easy way to pack things. If you're packing for transit, uh, again, we saw this hexagonal jug earlier, and here's another one with, again, significant weathering, especially on the top. Leave those areas open. Those areas are cut out to be much larger than the, the, the glass itself, so that you don't have any of that weathering or any of those fragile areas touching the foam. And we're using Tyvek here around the stronger part of the glass, which is the bottom, and it's wrapped around there to protect that. And, uh, and you continue on with the cutting of the foam and, and leaving it again open like this so that you don't have any pressure again, uh, even on the Tyvek. Uh, and then your last piece of foam would go on the top. So it's a pretty good way of, of packing glass, but if you want more uh, information, this is a great uh, article. It was published in JAIC 15 years ago uh, about moving and packing the collection at the uh, um, Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So storage. Glass is a sensitive material. It's not really as stable as we would like. Uh, I have seen uh, some glasses that have suffered over uh, prolonged storage on archaeological sites. And that's primarily because those archaeological sites have no climate control whatsoever. But in a museum, we should try to aim for a controlled climate. And we've recently just published this, aim for 45% plus or minus five. Uh, we're not talking about crystal glasses with archaeological glasses because in, in, in a sense, it's easy to understand that ar uh, archaeological glasses cannot crystal. They've already lost their alkali from burial. So there's no more alkali to be leached out and cause the instability that happens with crystalline. But keep that RH steady. As we all say in conservation, it's, you know, the steady uh, environment is much better than fluctuating and avoid ex um, extremes, both in humidity and temperature. And again, this is published just recently um, in the IIC preprints of the Turin Conference um, just in 2018. So I'm gonna leave it with that and hopefully you'll have some interesting questions. And the first and the last slides are glasses that were found on uh, the excavations at Samothrace. They were found in the cemeteries and that's where a lot of our glass is, is well preserved because people used it as, as burial gifts and in, inhumation burials. And so a lot of the glasses on Sabbath Rays came out almost intact or just, just lightly broken, but it's a fabulous collection. I think the second largest in all of Greece. So thank you and uh, I'm anxious to, for some questions. Thank you, Stephen.